The Startup Hour, giving entrepreneurs education, motivation, and inspiration from successful entrepreneurs from all corners of the country. The Startup Hour is a weekly business program bringing successful Zambian entrepreneurs, policymakers, and subject experts to share their stories, answer your burning business questions, and inform you on best practices. Tune in to the Startup Hour every Tuesday from 9 a.m. Startup Hour in association with Power FM. A very good morning indeed. Today on the Startup Hour show, we discuss exploiting economic opportunities with the chairman of uh, the Davilia group of companies, Mr. Ravi Davilia. Mr. Ravi Davilia was born 65 years ago and studied economics at the London School of Economics. He was appointed uh, chairman of uh, the Times of Zambia by then President uh, Frederick uh, Titus Chiloba. He was the youngest district governor in the world of Rotary International between 1995 and 1996 for Rotary District 9210, which consists of Tanzania, Botswana, Zambia, Madagascar, uh, Comoros, and Mayote. He is currently the CEO and chairman of uh, the Davilia Group of Companies. The group is involved in uh, property development, the supply of stationary items through his company Topshop to government ministries, p- p- private companies, and NGOs. His flagship company, Magic Advertising, is a one-stop shop that manufactures and sets up billboards, vinyl, and banner-wide format printing, vehicle branding, telescopic and ordinary flags, printing and embroidery of t-shirts, caps, mugs, keychains, mouse pads, and many other promotional items. He's also the chairman of the, the Zambia India Association, Automobile Army Advisory Board, Zambia and Malawi, and uh, the Zambia Canada Chamber of Commerce, as well as a member of the Resource Mobilization Committee uh, of the University of Zambia. Sir, good morning. Pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Patrick. Pleasure to be here. Indeed. It's a pleasure to have you on the program today, and we're happy that uh, you are, you're here to talk to us about your entrepreneurial journey and uh, the larger issue of uh, business in Africa. My name is Patrick Chifuambo, and uh, my co-host, uh, uh, Mwape Chisaka. Good morning to you, Mwape. Good morning, Patrick. How are I always mix up your mind. The NHS in England has no convincing plan. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Billion oh, goodness. Rifle. How's that? Good morning. There you go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Let's get right into it. First of all, what is it like, uh, what was it like growing up in Livingston uh, under a father who was uh, a freedom fighter? Thank you very much, Patrick. First of all, I used to be uh, uh, in Zambia India Friendship Association, chair and whatnot. Okay. Um, but at the moment, I'm in the Resource Mobilization Committee of uh, University of Zambia uh-huh. and um, a couple of other uh, organizations like uh, the National Road Safety Foundation. I'm the chairman, vice chairman there. Okay. And um, a few other organizations. But um, f- uh, to answer your question, Patrick, yes, it was very exciting. Um, uh, very, very, uh, it was like a roller coaster ride. You, you may ask me why like a roller coaster ride because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, my father was involved in the freedom struggle of Zambia. Mm-hmm. Um, he had sent uh, through the High Commission of India. Um, he was the president of the National Indian Congress of Northern Rhodesia. He had sent uh, eight or nine people to study in India. People like Godwin Ibiku Sitalu Anika, mm-hmm. um, so, uh, Simon Kapuepue, um, Atawina, Sikotawina, uh, Nalumina Mundia, uh, Daniel Lisulo, uh, Mr. Liso, Mr. Uh, Sipalo, and, and many others. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we, with that background, uh, we used to have a lot of uh, politicians, and under Dr. Kahunda's government, who used to come and, and then ha- have a general chat with my dad. Mm-hmm. And I used to be there next to him all the time. And I, I used to pick up a lot of information about uh, <laughs> about what's going on within the, the cabinet. You know, th- there were things like, there were a few complaints about some tribalism going on. And, mm-hmm. you know, one tribe complaining against the other. And, Mr. Divalia, can you please tell the president that, that uh, there's too much of this tribe being pushed in the cabinet? Mm-hmm. So I used to, uh, th- that's my first knowledge of what, what, what was happening in Zambia. Mm-hmm. And I think called One Zambia, One Nation was so important, even in those days, mm-hmm. in the early 60s. Uh, and then, then that, that's what uh, brought me into, in, into this awareness mm-hmm. of, of our mother country, Zambia. Mm-hmm. Did, did, did you at the time uh, realize who these personalities that you mentioned by name, did you realize who they were and how important they were to the struggle at the time? Oh, yes. Um, in fact, uh, but it was so risky. You see, mm-hmm. my father used to have these people uh, coming in 
and of course in those days the the colonial government was after him mm -hmm. um, he had to be so careful but you know what no matter how careful you are they always have their special branch special information service which picks up all these things and in those days he used to have several businesses mm -hmm. he had a bakery he had a mineral water factory he had a departmental store called Devalia's Emporium and Silk Bazaars. Mm -hmm. he, had a, uh, he had a restaurant called the Britannia Restaurant, which, uh, by the way, was the first restaurant that allowed non-white uh, peop uh, black people to, mm -hmm. to buy alcohol in that uh, restaurant. In mm -hmm. fact, that's why that place became, in Livingston, became a national heri heritage site. Mm -hmm. um, so all these things were so exciting. And, uh, you know, when... Uh, in 1962, the British government, no, no, not the British government, the colonial government mm -hmm. actually uh, pulled the rug under him by, by way of withdrawing his overdraft. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, the Standard Bank of South Africa was controlled by the British South Africa Company, mm -hmm. and it was part, in a way, of the colonial government that was at that time. And um, all his properties were, he went actually bankrupt in 1962 because of his uh, contribution to the freedom struggle. So we went through, as I said, a roller coaster ride, mm -hmm. and, and we went through ups and downs. Mm -hmm. So these are part of the f a few things that that really happened to our family. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Ravi, it's a it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, so at the time, your father's overdrafts were like pulled out, and 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 his businesses sort of like crumbled down, and and he remained with this one shop. You decided to take up that one shop and say, listen, I'm going to change this and I'm going to build something from this. But your brother said, no, why should we go back into this business? I want to know, what was that that, that, that took you to take up that business? No, it wasn't as simple as them saying no. Um, actually, what happened is um, I was studying in England and my elder brother passed away in Livingston. Mm -hmm. So um, even though I was studying... I, I did adequate studies in England. I wanted to study more. I wanted to get a doctorate, PhD, mm -hmm. whatever. But then I was rushed back into, into Zambia. At that time, I thought, my God, whatever, what's happened to me? So when I came back, my dad had just bought a, a, a dress factory mm -hmm. called Manhattan Fashions Limited, a very big factory, very organized factory. And I was thrust into it as in the marketing department. So when I was thrust into the marketing department, I used to go out on sales throughout Zambia, Lusaka, Copper Belt, uh, the Midlands. Um, and all that, and I got into the grips of the of, of, of the marketing thing. But at that time, in 1960, I think it was 1970, 71, it, there was these economic reforms in Zambia, mm -hmm. where a lot of people started returning the the dresses, because our factory was manufacturing dresses, ladies' dresses. Mm -hmm. And when the dresses started coming back, we had to sell back the factory to the original owner, and then uh, we were stuck with that shop. And obviously, in that shop, the shop had no capacity to feed two, three uh, brothers of mine yeah. um, who genuinely uh, would have helped. But what they felt is that, look, let's go out for um, and support the family in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then start off in Lusaka. One brother studied, uh, joined the BP. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he was a finance controller there, Subash, my, my elder brother. Mm -hmm. The other brother joined another company, uh, a trading company in, in Lusaka. They all did very well. But on my part, I, I looked at it and I said, OK, let me be there uh, with, with my dad and then and, 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 and run the shop and, and uh, you know, build up a surplus. And my vision was always to have an industry mm -hmm. and go into that dress business. So when that happened, I, I built up a little surplus. And of course, as I told you, since we had gone bankrupt yeah. in those mm -hmm. days in 1962, all the properties that my dad had were still mortgaged. Mm -hmm. So we had no money. So with the little surplus I had developed in the shop and a little capital I built, um, I bought five second-hand machines from a factory called Convoy Clothing. There was a shirt factory in Livingston called Convoy Clothing. There were a couple of Greek guys who used to play volleyball with me, so we mm -hmm. became friends at 100 kwacha each. So we, I invested in those machines. And my dad had a bakery building in, in Livingston. It yeah. was empty. So I said, Dad... Come on, let's go into partnership. My dad said, are you sure you're going to be able to, <laughs> to do, the, do this? Yeah. And do you want me to join you? Come on, I'm old. I said, no, dad, you may be old, but you have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I respect you a lot. And, and you have a lot of connections and contacts and everything. And just the respect that I had, that we had for each other, mm -hmm. we started this dress factory. 
in, in Livingston called Cleopatra Fashions. Cleopatra Fashions. That's right. <laughs> At a very young age, it, I was only 23 years old, mm -hmm. and I started this. Some people may ask, may, may, ask may, may suggest that you need a lot of capital to start business, mm -hmm. but I would say that what you need is, if you're young, yes, what you need is passion. Uh, if you're passionate about your um, your product. And if you're sure about the marketing, because I had the market under me, mm -hmm. under my control, because I had been the, the marketing person in the previous factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goodwill of people. You see, once people uh, realize that you have the passion, they trust your passion, they trust um, you, they say, right. Even if you, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you buy goods from them like i had to buy fabrics from various companies like limbadas mm -hmm. shah textiles in uh, dola mm -hmm. amin and company who used to if i couldn't pay them in the stipulated 30 days or so then mm -hmm. i would go and tell them look please can you can you please extend the bill another four or five months because mm -hmm. i'll pay you back and the trust that they would have in you they would say okay no problem but make sure that you pay in four months <laughs> yeah don't <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way i created the capital Ah. Uh, you see, you have the goodwill of the people, the credit that you develop, and that's how I started my factory. The other thing I, I did was advertising. On the front page of every newspaper, in those days, Times of Zambia, mm -hmm. Daily Mail, you would see at my label. Mm -hmm. I used to say, look for this label, mm -hmm. uh, available at all leading stores in Zambia. So you see the... the the shopkeeper or the, the, or the store w would think, am I not a leading store? How come uh, I don't have this? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> See, it's, a, it's all a psychology. Yeah. So, um, and my dresses were, but not cheaper. My dresses were 50% more expensive than all the other dresses. What? Yeah, because I had to, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to, to, to include the, the marketing side of mm -hmm. it. You see, advertising is expensive. I, imagine front page of a newspaper. Yeah, that, that costs a lot. It's quite expensive. So that's how... Uh, the whole thing started, and Cleopatra Fashions grew from five machines, you know, those second-hand machines, mm -hmm. to 100 machines, 120 uh, straight machines. And we, I, I was employing 300 workers Whoa. within four or five years, and we grew exponentially. And then uh, the marketing... And, with the, and then the banks were running after me rather than me running yeah, after the banks. Yeah, it was the opposite <laughs> now. <laughs> I, I, I want to take you back a bit and, uh, and touch of the, on the issue of uh, bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. You were at a young age, 23 at the time, and then you know your family business obviously being bankrupt. Uh, uh, was that a catalyst in, uh, in you going forward? Well, catalyst in a way that we had no capital mm -hmm. because all the assets like the properties and so on were still mortgaged. Mm -hmm. The mortgage issue was sorted out five or six years later when when all the properties were released. You know, it takes time before you pay back your, mm -hmm. your creditors and so on. So eventually, the catalyst in a way that there's no other way out, Patrick. Mm -hmm. You've got to work hard and fight for survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I ask us is because today, this was in the 1962, if, I, if I'm correct. Yes. Uh, today, they, you know, the young people would tell you that, you know, they, they, they can't access capital or, or you know, their, their business has gone under and, and they're scared to start again. And yet there you were, you know, you, there was nothing to start from. You, you built from scratch. Yes, because I had vision, I had passion, mm -hmm. I knew people, you know, there were many factories, Patrick, in, in that time. There were, must be about 40, 50 dress factories mm -hmm. in Zambia. So people were telling me, what are you going into? You're going into something that, that is so common, that is, you're going to face amazing opposition mm -hmm. in the market. I said, no, I know what I'm doing. I have the market under my control. You see, the main thing is you've got to have something sewn up. You've got to have something under your control before you have that guts to go for it. And, um, and you know one thing, uh, Patrick, one learns as one, one goes on. Mm -hmm. The best time to learn uh, or make mistakes is when you are young. Mm -hmm. And the mistakes that you make, look, if you ask any successful person, he must have made a lot of mistakes before he started making success, mm -hmm. b before he's uh, uh, becoming su successful. And uh, that's the way you come up, because the best university in this world is w if you fail in a few things. <laughs> because then you sit back and say, why did I fail? I could have done it uh, in a different way. Mm -hmm. But you see, as uh, Winston Churchill said, only a madman will do the same things over and over again Expecting and expect a, a different, different result. result. Mm -hmm. So you've got to try different methods and different solutions 
for different situations. Marketing. Mm. How, how critical uh, was it at the time uh, in the 1960s? You, you said you had vision, you had passion. How important was the aspect of uh, marketing in your business? And I want to fast forward it to today. How important is marketing in the 21st century? Well, marketing was, is, and always will be the most important aspect in a business. Because no matter if, what item you have to sell, even if you have gold, if you don't have the marketing sewn up, you can't even give it away for free. <laughs> Because marketing is such a thing, communicating skills. You've got to be able to to to, to talk about your product and, and differentiate your product from the other people's product. Mm -hmm. And marketing will always be the most important aspect of a business in this world. Because whether it's any product that you have, any service that you have, mm -hmm. if you cannot market it and communicate yourself properly to the public or to your customer, you'll never be able to sell it. But the main thing in marketing is, first of all, you market yourself. You may be asking me, I mean, there are, there's a bigger list of, of all, the, all the organizations I'm, I was a member of and I am still a member of. Mm -hmm. it's, all a, it's all a point of marketing yourself. Mm -hmm. Because in the organization, it's like, say, take Rotary, for example. Mm -hmm. When people see you working, people see you fundraising, people see your sincerity, I mean, there are other people, there could be bankers there, there could be suppliers there, there could be many important politicians there. Mm -hmm. they, they start trusting you. The moment you develop that trust, then it's very easy to sell your product. And the worst thing a marketing person can do is try to stuff a customer with something more than what that, that would uh, be actually required. The best trick in marketing is to show sincerity. If you are sincere, If you're pro then the people will buy your product. It is, uh, uh, a, a, a gentleman once told me that what you need to sell is your value proposition. Yes. Is, is that what you would call sincerity in business? Yes. Well, what, what you promise is what you will give. Yes. Not only that, mm -hmm. but if I, as a, as a marketing person, see that a particular dress in those days, for example, would not sell in your shop, then it would be doing you a di myself a disservice. If I sell you and guarantee, oh, take this product, it will um, work. It, it, it's going to work. Then yeah. the next time I come, that product is still lying on your shelf. So when that thing happens, the, the person will say, ah, even if I, my product is good the next time, the person will say, ah, I won't buy from Ravi. Mm -hmm. Or I won't buy from Patrick. Because the last time I bought the product, it's still lying in my shelf. Mm -hmm. But the guarantee I used to give is that if you can't sell your product, I'll take it back. So when that happened, I developed an ownership in the person's shop mm -hmm. because for, I, got a, uh, I got to have a, my product lying in his shop free mm -hmm. of charge mm -hmm. because normally you pay rent mm -hmm. because that person pays rent for his shop. But there was my product on his shelf free of charge because, I mean, you try selling your product in the UK or Canada or wherever it is just to get that entry point would be a big problem. It's like going to say ShopRite or, or Pick and Pay or any of these big shops and you have say cooking oil or you have sugar. No matter what, how hard you try to get entry into these big shops is very difficult. So if you go and tell them, look, here's my sugar, here's my beans, here's my potatoes or whatever, I'll take back if you can't sell them. It's, the chances are that they'll say no. This space in, in, that we have is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you see, to get entry is very important. And I managed to get entry uh, for my products for, of Cleopatra Fashions dresses. Mm -hmm. See, number one, you have good sound advertising. Mm -hmm. What do you think people like Samsung or LG and so on are doing? They have a huge marketing uh, budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you keep a Samsung product or LG product or, or any other product, The product, the, pro, the name sells, right? Mm -hmm. See? So the first, you have to sell yourself, sell your name, and then the product goes. How, how were you able to do this? Like you mentioned, there were so many other you know, competitors in the, in the textile industry that you were in. How were you able to position yourself? Because I want to believe that that, that is still the trend today, is how do you position your business with so much competition in this global village now? Yes. The simple answer to that, Patrick, is service. If you give better service, if you give, 
like like uh, and a better brand awareness of your product and it doesn't have to be cheaper you see people have a very false impression in this world it has to be that cheap if your pro- <laughs> product is cheaper it's going to sell no it doesn't what people want is better service and better brand awareness if your brand is more powerful than the other one it's going to sell this is what happened to cleopatra fashions we were twice as expensive as the other dresses but because that of the name you know because people thought and knew that our product was better than the other person's product it just sold when the other people came in they had their own way you see the other thing i have to tell you patrick is that you have to have your own approach for follow your own gut feeling you don't have to follow what other people are doing okay you follow the good things that the other people are doing mm-hmm. but you do it your own way once you get the concept the major concept overall concept of marketing follow it read read the the the, uh, the bigger brand manuals read what other big people have done see what steve jobs has done see bill gates has done what other other read about the biographies of these people great big business people in the in the field people like mukesh ambani dhirubhai ambani in india they are big names then you look at uh, how mtn came up how zambif came up how pick and pay started how shop right started and you you must if you follow all that then you'll see that the principle is more or less what i'm i'm Similar. trying to talk about mm-hmm. yes not not what other people you see what the, the, the smaller people do is they they're afraid of everything yeah never be afraid of failure and uh, you see if you don't try then your failure rate is 100% if you try then you have at least 50% chance of succeeding <laughs> yeah and speaking of trying you got into business at uh, a very young age 22 and uh fast forwarding to now the, we feel like when you go out as a young person as an entrepreneur you go out uh, to sell your business certain people will look down on you because of your age they'll be like nah you're too young to be in business what what what, what type of value can we get from someone who who's only been in business i don't know a day or a week Yeah yeah you see I you are very right I experienced that when I was young um I used to feel ah, people going to take me as a young guy um but then soon they discover that with your uh, passion and um, the delivery that you have and so on but you know you got to look at it the other way around you got to say look the other person is too old anyway <laughs> uh, me I'm young I've got more years left in me yeah. and l- count your blessings you see look at the positive side of a s- situation now i'm actually 66 years old so um when i was 23 years old or 24 25 or 26 27 i used to look i try to look older today i try to look younger, younger. <laughs> <laughs> you see my mustache started getting gray uh-huh. so i took off my mustache <laughs> and now people say oh uh, but but i try to keep my myself fit uh-huh. uh, keep my weight mm-hmm. down i do my running i do my exercises and plus i like i like to laugh a lot you know i like to uh, mingle with young people because the thing is young pe- you have we older people have a lot to learn from young people because the passion they have uh, the knowledge like like the internet knowledge they have uh, is much more than what we have some of us were bbc you know <laughs> born, born before, before computer. computers <laughs> so, so if i want to pick up something in in, in, the, in the in the computer field i ask my son mm-hmm. um, or even my grandson <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> he knows more than me so you see you, you keep your mind open and you can learn from even the youngest person as a foundation how important was it for you to have uh, gone through the london school of economics because you you made reference to uh, you know having to read as an entrepreneur having to read about uh, you know some of the moguls that are that are around bill gates and and, and what not but how was how, how important was that Uh, economics foundation for you to be successful to oh, be where I, you are today. I, I think amazing mm-hmm. because you see the type of education you get in, in places like England and so mm-hmm. on you read a lot mm-hmm. the, the libraries are so well stocked mm-hmm. and they encourage you to read and every project you have you have to read up all the great uh, authors and and some so some of the great people are there so you even talk to them and then you know they they believe in current affairs you got to even now i've got a habit of listening to watching bloomberg mm-hmm. uh, you know cnbc you know all these uh, uh, business uh, television programs i like to follow what's happening in the market 
commodity prices. You see, it's so important to know why we are in a situation like this. Mm-hmm. The last couple of years, the, pr- the price of copper has gone down. Why mm-hmm. it has gone down? When will it come up? So it, it helps you to plan. Because when you uh, read on economics, when you read, uh, then you know what's happening in the world. Mm-hmm. Why the copper price is down? Why the gold price is down? Why mm-hmm. the iron price is down? Still, so, you know, it, it, you got to f- read, read, and read. Mm-hmm. And keep up to date. Uh, so the background in England uh, helped me a lot. Mm. The the you said you have to read a lot, uh, be be aware of uh, current affairs. Uh, and having grown up in a house where you were looking at, uh, you know, uh, uh, freedom fighters come come through your doors, uh, do you do you do you know or do you believe that uh, politics and economics go in tandem? Oh yes, you know I I, I dabbled a bit in politics as well. You know mm. I was. Treasurer for Lusaka Province, uh, President Chiluba appointed me. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's under the MMD? MM, the MMD. MMD. Oh. I was the, uh, uh, with Honorable Chawinga, Christopher uh-huh. Chawinga, if you remember, he was yeah. the chairman. Uh-huh. And of course, our national chairman, our national secretary was Mr. Sata. Uh-huh. You know, so we learned a lot from people like, like them. And uh, then you realize that, uh, you know, life is not only about making money. Life is also about giving back to society. Because at the end of the day, when you're on your deathbed, Patrick, you'll, the first thing you'll think about is, of course, God. I mean, I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying you don't think about <laughs> yeah. it. But then the first thing you'll think about is, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. I wish I had, I wish I had started a, a bank. Mm-hmm. I wish I had started a clothing factory. I wish I had started a, a travel agency. I wish I had started and gone into advertising. Mm-hmm. I wish I had started... Oh, selling ice creams or, or coffee, or mm-hmm. <laughs> having a Starbucks uh, yeah, yeah. franchise. Or, you see, so the thing to do is, uh, at the end of the day, on your, on your last breath that you take, these are the thoughts that are going to go through your mind. And also, oh, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. Mm-hmm. I wish I had been with my daughter or my son or my grandkids. Or I wish I'd spent more time with them. You see, so the thing to do is do everything now that, that uh, while you are still fit and alive. Mm-hmm. So, so you know these are the things that should motivate a, pers- a person and bring out the best from you. Um, you talking of uh, motivation and having looking back on life, you, you, when you were when you were starting your factory, uh, you were also starting your family at the time. Um, we had uh, a guest on a previous show. He talked about how having a partner who was in formal employment, helped him become an entrepreneur because then he didn't want to have to worry about <laughs> yeah, or everything that happens. So um, how was that in your case? Well, I got married when I was 28 years old. and I, My wife is from India. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, okay, I'm, I've always been an entrepreneur, as I said already. Yeah. I started at a very young age. I used to burn the candle at both ends. It means I used to smoke heavily. I used to drink heavily and whatever. But then when I married, my wife didn't come from an entrepreneur family, but her father was in insurance business. Mm-hmm. He was a general manager of East Africa, and he held very senior positions. So um, my wife also went, uh, you know, my father-in-law used to entertain a lot of business people and so on. So she knew what business people are, uh, big business people. But she was very well grounded. She very, uh, very calm in her approach. So what happened to me is that she, that had a very calming effect on me, mm. that uh, a cooling effect. I, you know, I had that that burning desire to do this and that and whatever. So I uh, was very careful about my health. I stopped smoking. I stopped. I uh, reduced my drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I like now uh, very occasionally uh, have a wine or something, but I try to avoid. Health is so important. Mm. So and when your kids. Uh, grow up and so on. You got to be with your kids and and you spend more time with your family, uh, generally. So this is what happened uh, when I got married. That had a very good effect on me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This is the Startup Hour. Today we're discussing exploiting economic opportunities with the chairman of uh, the Devalia group of companies, Mr. Ravi Devalia. I want to ask you this. Uh, I was reading uh, your profile and uh, you you are into all kinds of businesses, marketing predominantly, advertising, uh, real estate development. 
I want to maybe zero in on uh, real estate development. Looking at that, the city is forever changing. Every every day we're seeing uh, something it's new. It's like a construction yeah, site. Yeah, it's a construction <laughs> site, literally. <laughs> How do you position yourself uh, when, when you're deciding what kind of venture to go into in terms of uh, property development? Well, the first property that I started, okay, um, I was living in a house um, in Olympia Extension mm-hmm. on a rented property. Then I made an offer to the owner to buy it out, so I bought it out. So that was my first property here. Okay, I have many properties in Livingston, you know, where uh, where we had been stationed mm-hmm. uh, for a long time. But that was my first venture into property. And then, um, if you remember, uh, we had a lot of businesses in Society House, including a bank. There was a fire there, so uh, we had to shift. And when, we, when I went into this other property, again... Um, it used to belong to some uh, parastatal, and we paid heavy rent. Then after a while, it was on for sale because that parastatal offloaded all its properties into the market. Mm-hmm. And our, the first offer came to me since I was the sitting tenant. Mm-hmm. And I bought that property on uh, on uh, Addis Ababa Drive on Chipovu Road, that, the magic advertising office which is there. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, that area is prime now. Mm-hmm. Now, the property I had in Olympia Park Extension. O- okay, I also bought another property in Kalundu behind uh, uh, Mulungushi village. Mm-hmm. Now the property that I had a house in, I knocked it down and I built a, I had the best designer from South Africa, Mr. Francois Murray. Uh, he designed this property and I put in a couple of million dollars worth of uh, uh, money, but not borrowed, but, but my own money. So thank God. <laughs> Otherwise today, <laughs> if it was borrowed, it would, I'd yeah, be paying interest, a lot of interest <laughs> and the squeeze that we are going through. So it's just about to finish. Now that's like a mini mall. It's going to be a lot of uh, space. It's about 1,500 square meters of uh, of open uh, space, and it's very beautifully designed. And I've got many other plots that are here, which I'm developing soon. But um, there again, you see, uh, you cannot generalize, uh, Patrick. Mm-hmm. Uh, you find a space. Um, uh, you can have a targeted, uh, targeted uh, development. You say, right, I want to now build uh, an office block, or mm-hmm. I want to build a... But you have a space which is there already. You convert it into, into, into business uh, uh, space mm-hmm. and then decide uh, what's good. You see, you, you could build rented apartments which are in big demand in Lusaka. You see, Lusaka is a very thriving community. Mm-hmm. We have two and a half million people in Lusaka. And uh, we don't depend that much on copper as, as the price of copper as the people in Copper Belt uh, have to depend because there, the moment the copper price goes down, everything goes. Uh, there's a depression going on. Mm-hmm. But here, there are other things moving. You know, services and and, and, and and a lot of money flow. If you go to Manda Hill, for example, um, at at 18 hours or so on, you won't find parking space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the the way people are buying, you'll think, my God, are we in a recession or what? Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah. think that. <laughs> yeah, I <it> just. <laughs> <laughs> and the cars people drive these four by fours, and yo, you say, yo, oh, yo. <laughs> Zambia is a first world country. You know? mm-hmm. So you got to, you know, you cannot generalize. Um, you get your property if you have the resources, build it. But the other thing is again marketing. If you cannot get, because now it's, it's no more, there's no shortage of properties. It's not easy to get good tenants uh, for, for, for whatever project you have. You've got to market yourself properly. Mm-hmm. And uh, you see, like in any business, any business you start in Zambia, there'll be 10, 15, 20 people jumping into the, mm-hmm. the competition. So you've got to develop your niche and, and do it your way. I mean, I'm not a huge property developer. They're much bigger than me. But what I do is I have a basket of uh, businesses I have, mm-hmm. and it slowly adds up. And you don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know. So you spread out your risks, financial risks and so on. And uh, that's how you develop your portfolio. You see, you, you, look, you must look at your investments mm-hmm. as if you have a portfolio. Uh, you put some money in low-risk uh, investments, mm-hmm. medium-risk investments, and then in some keep a small amount 10-15% in high risk investments mm-hmm. which is fun you know the money that you feel okay if it goes it goes yeah but otherwise it'll, when it earns you a lot of money 200-300% mm-hmm. return you say wow you know it gives you a satisfaction mm-hmm. so that's how you balance your portfolio but uh, I, I want to ask this do, do you study the mood the trends of like you you, you say you know, the, the, the Lusaka community is thriving it's, it's growing do, do, do you carefully study the trends do you look at oh 
there's a lot of four by fours now. Maybe I should invest in something a automobile or automo- <laughs> automotive spares or something. Do you study the trends? Is that what gives you the next uh, big idea or the next investment opportunity? Yes, I have. I in my mind are you very very alert to what's going on around very, you? Very very much because mm. you see what what uh, I I do and what normally people should do is listen listen talk to people. You know, talk less. Them, uh, no, no, even talk. <laughs> if you have something to talk, talk. Uh-huh. But listen, talk, discuss with people about ideas. Uh-huh. I mean, it could be automotive industry, it could be whatever, advertising, uh-huh. banking, it could be investing, uh, because then you know what's happening in the country. Uh-huh. Which investor has come into the country with big money? Which investors are, uh, you know, interesting? What field is interesting in Zambia? Because things are changing so fast. Uh-huh. If you don't keep your ear to the ground, you're uh-huh. gone. So... You got to keep abreast with all these developments that are going on here, because at certain, st- you know, there are some people who are coming in huge money, with huge money, and uh, people are. You have some people who keep on complaining, like uh, just yesterday there was somebody saying, "Oh, what's happening to our, our economy?" Blah blah blah. I said, "Okay, fine, um, but you know why? Uh, what it is? Very the copper price is slowly going yeah. up, mm-hmm. and you see the Zambian economy was only five thousand. I mean, five billion co- uh, dollars." Mm-hmm. Just a few years ago, mm-hmm. today it is twenty-seven billion dollars, and growing. At least it's growing. There are certain economies in the world which have, which have a stagnant and mm-hmm. negative growth, mm-hmm. but at least our economy is going up. And once a few things get sorted out, look for opportunities. Mm-hmm. Don't sit and complain and have a negative approach in life. Mm-hmm. Think positive. Think positive and find, get hold of your opportunities and go for business. Um, um, yeah, speaking of looking at opportunities, you, 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 you've, ha- you've had a bank, you've run a travel agency, you've run a factory. Um, was there ever a business plan in this entire conglomerate that was coming up? Um, yes, a business plan. You must have a business plan because without a business plan, you can't uh, really come up. But you see, it's like now. Um, you haven't seen any notes. You see me speaking without notes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because sometimes I speak better without uh, I, without notes. Uh, because it just comes from the mind. Mm. So in the same way, you at times in business, you have a gut feeling that this is the ti- right time f- in the nation as well as for you. Because it doesn't only have to be a national requirement. It has to be your own requirement. Because you may feel that this is the time for you to start a particular business. So you marry those things, two things, get the right people in the right place. You don't have to be an expert in everything, yeah. mm-hmm. but you employ experts, good mm-hmm. experts um, in, in those things. And it, business is all about, it's a simple trading exercise. Mm-hmm. You trade your service, but you buy and sell service, or you buy and sell commodities. It's all about buying and selling. And uh, if you keep it simple, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, silly. <laughs> you buy a product for one dollar, you sell it for two dollars. <laughs> your expense is fifty cents. What is your profit? One dollar fifty, 50 cents mm. is your profit. That fifty cents is your profit. Okay, don't complicate it by, by all this <coughs> jargon and, and and you know what people do is they complicate it. The first thing they do, for example, is when they have uh, some capital inflow, they buy a car, or, or they buy a so, you know nice house or mm. some huge furniture for the, the for their house. And when that happens. It takes away from your capital. Mm-hmm. The moment the m- money is withdrawn from the capital, your working capital drops. And once your working capital level drops, it, it, you're, you're, you know, you'll be short of capital. So you only start drawing out later on. Once you, are, you have the mass, once you are big enough, once your business is doing so well, and then slowly, slowly. You see, Warren Buffett has got the same house for the past 30 years. And it's not even so big. <laughs> He's driving the same car which he had 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And Warren, Warren Buffett is the second richest man in the world. He's worth about $64 billion. So the really rich people, they don't try to show off. They, they keep a low profile and whatever it is. They show off, yes, the bank balance speaks <laughs> 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 <It's> louder. <everything. laughs> it speaks louder. Uh, I yeah. want to take you back to uh, the economy. Uh, a, lo- a lot of talk now, like you said, as, as you go about talking to people, and I think this is maybe across the board. A lot of people are complaining. Yeah, money is tight. Money is not way to be seen and whatnot. But like you, you were just alluding to the fact that uh, you know the economy is growing. 
uh, and that we need to seek opportunities in uh, perhaps the negatives. Uh, for, for instance, uh, I heard uh, one of our guests say, look, people are complaining about load shedding. Well, why not be the solution to that? Mm -hmm. You know, that's an opportunity there, an investment opportunity. Do you look at the negative trends in our economy as an opportunity that you seriously look into? Yes, of course. You see, the moment the load shedding comes in, what do you think of? Solar, okay. Solar power, S gensets. Yeah. Start selling gensets. Yeah. I was walking along uh, Cha 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 Road the other day, and there are shops selling gensets. The shops are packed. I said, wow, the entrepreneurs in Zambia have reacted. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen solar panels mm -hmm. all over Lusaka. In these and they're getting cheaper by cha -cha -cha the day. Road and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so people are jacked up. Zambian entrepreneurs are really jacked up. And you don't have to tell them what to do. I mean, some of them might be listening to me and they'll, they'll advise me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what's happening. So people in Zambia are very hardworking. And if you go to some places, 24 hours a day, they're working. They're either welding things or mm -hmm. if you go if you go to all these townships and so on everybody's working hard kalinga linga yes kalinga linga they're working very hard and that's why the crime rate has dropped if you if you notice so uh, if you re remember 25 years ago people were scared of armed robbers and this mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. such things are not happening now you have only sporadic uh, gangs which are appearing in the horizon mm -hmm. but this is what happens everybody in zambia wants to do something new and they want to come up in life. And that's a very good sign, mm -hmm. I believe. I, I, want, I want to move uh, slightly, uh, uh, if, if I may, uh, and maybe uh, move to the political business rhyme of, uh, of your life. Uh, you, you mentioned advice. Is, is it something that you often give to the powers that be in, uh, in the political cir circles, the decision makers in, 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 in our country, uh, as a businessman? who's been around for, for a while, do you tell them, hey, Buana, maybe here, you should try to have this in the budget or try to go this direction to grow this industry or to grow the economy as a whole? You see, Patrick, I've been very fortunate. Uh, my background, uh, the family name, the mm -hmm. Valia family. Mm -hmm. um, so pe and I've, I've tried to develop it. If you remember, I was chairman for Times of Zambia mm -hmm. for, for six years, the longest serving chairman appointed by President Chiluba and, uh, and all that. And have an opportunity to serve in in, 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 in uh, social so, social clubs, mm -hmm. party structures, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been very fortunate in that um, it has been easier uh, than other people for for me even to approach presidents. Mm -hmm. Every president um, uh, since 1964 has been uh, approachable for me. But I but I, the only reason sometimes the only reason that I approach them is to. To, no, not advise, because you cannot advise a president. Come on. <laughs> I mean, the, he has a lot of advisors around him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the only thing is when you get scared that what's going to happen here? Uh, because I've committed myself to Zambia. Even my son is here with me in business. I've, uh, okay, I was a few years in Canada, whatever it is, but I'm here. And there are people here who have given a lot of their lives to Zambia and they've put in a lot at stake in Zambia. And... Uh, you know, I would give advice, yes. I would say, look, let's uh, be careful of so-and-so groups that are in Zambia mm -hmm. who are trying to pull us down. Let us be whatever it is, you know. But, of course, you cannot, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say, because it's, a lot of things are confidential. Mm -hmm. But I have had the privilege to, uh, to to meet many presidents, and most of the presidents in Zambia. And sometimes I even help, mm -hmm. even in fundraising activities and things like that. We contribute that way. But the thing I always believe in, Patrick, is always support the president in power. Mm -hmm. As a businessman, you cannot antagonize the government of the day. Because the first principle of business is that you've got to go with the tide. Mm. Whoever, whoever's in power, you've got to to support. So that is the trend. But the, you see, the mistake some people make is that uh, um, they... Uh, uh, some political people become business people and they say they forget that they're business people and they start a attacking the government so that's a very dangerous uh, situation if if you want to do business do business if you want to do politics do politics in politics oh yes uh, human rights everything you have to uh, you know you, you have to be sort of uh, open mm -hmm. about the situation and uh, be frank mm -hmm. the thing is in business you have to support the, the government of the day. Mm -hmm. So whoever comes into power, you have to respect and support. Otherwise, how can you do, do business? You know, 
the, the, the meaning of business is that you've got to have the wind behind your back to, mm. to, to, to pull you along. Not the wind in front of you to block you, no. Mm. Otherwise, you'll be blocked in any enterprise that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now, through, through some of the associations that uh, you've been affiliated with, uh, Rotary, the, the Zambia India Association, my, my, my question was a bit more perhaps uh, pertinent in that I wanted to find out, do you, as maybe like say for the Automotive uh, Advisory Board, do you actually... Uh, put papers, do you present papers maybe, say, to the Minister of Finance to say, look, we, we as a business community, we need A, B, C, D, or w would you kindly oblige to you know, reduce the duty on this because then you would develop the automotive industry? Do, do you present? Have you done that in the past? Uh, well, not uh, because, you see, most of the organizations that you see I'm a member of mm -hmm. are not, uh, they're more social organizations. Right. So, I mean, what we do is that we do fundraising, we do charity, we do things like that. Mm -hmm. But through our chambers of commerce and so on, we do push certain aspects. But the thing is, of course, if I have the opportunity to meet the Minister of Finance or even the President or, mm -hmm. or anything, we, we talk about mm -hmm. that, look, um, things like electricity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the best thing to do was to have increased the price of electricity. In the long run? Uh, no, immediately. Because, immediately. Because what would have happened is that people would have started investing more into uh, the hydroelectric power and, and even solar. Mm -hmm. Because for you to put up a solar plant, uh, you've got to have a return of your capital investor, in, mm -hmm. invested. You mm -hmm. can't be... Um, because we are way below the, the, men, the cost of, uh, of, of uh, production mm -hmm. as far as electricity is concerned. That's a fact. But look... We, the price of copper is low, and uh, there's already a lot of shocks for the people. So I'm sure the government must have made their, their research and, and decided that, look, for the moment it may not be right for the price to have gone up, mm -hmm. if you understand what I mean. So they must have made the evaluation and whatnot. But really, um, we, we have given advice, and I have given advice to various people, uh, because there are many people who wanted to invest through me, for example. Mm -hmm in the solar industry and so on. What I do is I, I do consulta consultancy as well. Mm. So this is for foreign investors? Foreign investors. Okay. So imagine if a foreign investor wants to come here, the first thing he'll look at is how much I, is he getting per unit? Mm -hmm. um, how much would he get per unit for if he sells it to Zesco, you know, the electricity? Mm -hmm. And at the moment, it's way, way, way below. So, well, uh, then look, you can look at other investors. You look at people investing in agriculture or, or whatever it is. Is for example, just next week we're getting. I'm getting one of the r richest people in Egypt coming into in, invest into Zambia. They heard about me, so they contacted me, and he said, "Right, uh, would you be able to arrange for some meetings?" I said, "Yeah, no problem." And they want to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in Zambia. So we'll be meeting various people and uh, discussing about investments. There's another group, one of the biggest group in East Africa. Is coming in uh, next month into, into Zambia, and uh, they've somehow contacted me through uh, through another source, and uh, they, they'll be putting up a lot of things, plastics and and uh, soaps and oh, a huge! Mm -hmm. you know, they're one of the biggest companies in East Africa, so mm -hmm. they're all coming into Zambia. Mm -hmm. The advantage that Zambia has is the easy exchange control regulations that we have here. The ease of that has a very chunk, big chunk in the ease of doing business aspect in Zambia. So this is why, even though the copper price is low, we still have a lot of interest in Zambia. <laughs> because uh, And Zambia is surrounded by eight or nine countries. And we are not landlocked. We are actually land-linked uh, as, we, as we market ourselves. Correction. <laughs> we, should, we should market ourselves in that manner. <laughs> no, they have. The, the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the authorities here do market themselves as land-linked. Linked. Uh -huh. But you see, if we, are, if we talk about it more, then it helps. Mm. It changes the, the perception of it. Yeah, the whole paradigm is changed. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, um, I wanted to ask, since we've been talking a lot about how uh, entrepreneurship helps in, uh, in the political sphere, in the social sphere, can we then say that entrepreneurship can help Zambia's economic uh, pressures, if you will? Oh, yes, because you see, Zambia has got the highest uh, number of young people in Africa, if not in the world, in, uh, below 25 or below 30. Um, I, I know the statistics are available, yeah. but, uh, but it's, it's, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. you know, we have one of the highest levels. 
And uh, there's such a surge. Like I, I talked uh, you, yeah. at that uh, Protea Hotel at that startup junction uh, meeting, and I was so amazed at the passion and uh, the energy that the young people have in Zambia. I've already to- talked about the the entrepreneurs on along Cha 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 Road and uh-huh. mm-hmm. and along uh, you know in you know, in Lusaka, and most of them are young, and you know it's if if they are given more opportunity to come up. I, th- I think a lot of them will become dangotes of, of the world because uh, uh, this is this is how I'm sure Mr. Aliko Dangote started. Um, you know, if you remember, we used to have Mishanga boys in, in the uh-huh. old days uh-huh. selling cigarettes and along the streets, and we used to mistreat them many many years ago. I think you were not even born then. <laughs> 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 we used to Guilty. they used to be picked up and and whacked. You know uh-huh. and and. and, and and caned, mm-hmm. but these are the same people who, if w- they were encouraged, would have become the Dangotes by now. So anyway, th- we are going on the r- in the right direction. I'm sure the government is definitely aware of the young energy and the young people uh, who are striving to to, to become something. Mm-hmm. And um, they have a lot of opportunities. You know, they have the CEC. Um, a lot of banks are now in. Uh, there's a huge money coming into the the youth programs and so on. And um, they they will be developed, mm. and then and we we it it will succeed. Mm. Yeah. Th- th- there's a lot of talk uh, that uh, you know tourism, the tourism industry is 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 the next sector to to look out to. Uh, obviously, agriculture, service, and uh, manufacturing. How would you, in a nutshell, describe the, these four industries, namely tourism, mm. uh, agriculture, mm. service uh, industry, uh, as as a uh, as a way for, for growth for, for of the course, economy. Of course, of course. You know, we have to diversify our economy, Patrick. Mm. Zambia is there's too much mono, it's the mono economy. Mm. You know, th- we depend too much upon copper and things like cobalt and things like that. So we have to diversify. But the problem is, this is a song we sing every time the copper price is down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the moment copper price goes up, we, we forget about we it. We forget about <laughs> tourism. <laughs> you know, so... So we have to develop the tourism sector. You see, we have the one of the seven wonders of the world in Zambia. Aren't we fortunate? Uh, there, there are over 200 countries in the world. Mm-hmm. And we have Victoria Falls yes. in Zambia. Apart from Victoria Falls, I think the tourism uh, board and council is doing a great job. You'll find a lot of these Chishimba Falls and, and other tourism uh, as. Uh, Aspects, the the other attractions that you have, mm-hmm. which are being projected now, yeah. and I think they're doing a great job. But the thing is, we should have, we should do more, and we should see, and we should quantify the amount of money that's coming into Zambia properly and talk about it, because these are called invisible exports. Mm-hmm. When money comes in by way of uh, uh, tourists, it's, it's called invisible exports. We're gaining foreign exchange, so it's so important. Agriculture. We have 40% of the water supply in the region. And in the region, if not more. And we cry about, oh, there's no water in Kariba, no water in Kariba. That's why we are load shedding. <laughs> but we are supposed to have 40% of water in, in the whole of in the whole region. So, and you see now, okay, uh, the semi desert is creeping up from, from south. Yeah. You know, the southern province is no more as lucrative as it, as it used to be in the old days. But look at the northern province. Look at. Uh, upwards of Lusaka, mm-hmm. you know, th- there's much more rainfall there, and uh, okay, things are happening. The, the coffee uh, plantations being developed, tea, coffee, and other sugar. I understand a very big sugar th- uh, thing is coming up in Luena or whatever it is, and uh, we have to diversify into agriculture. The government, I think, has already demarc- demarcated one million hectares of of land, which is going to be opened out. And uh, for agriculture, things like soya uh, production, soya and other production, you know, which is so valuable in Zambia. And also for export, because the soya cake can be exported and is exported to countries like, like Zimbabwe and so on, earning huge potential for exports. So soya and, and other products, uh, it's just amazing. They have a full study, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ZDA and so mm-hmm. on are well organized. They mm-hmm. have everything sorted out. And the, the thrust is coming, so we, so agriculture is definitely, uh, but a value-added agriculture, value-added should be there, yeah, and uh, you know that that should be the thrust. But the thing is, what the government is of, of course doing the right thing. They're giving incentives. They'll give incentives for people to start uh, a, 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 pro, uh, a program. You see, 
Business is all about in, in, incentives, tax incentives, whatever it is, you know. All these, when the incentives are thrown in, people get encouraged to start those businesses. If you remember, remember when UBZ was closed, mm -hmm. there was an incentive to start... Uh, Think the buy bus, many buses mini and whatnot, buses. they were zero rated. Yeah, so, mm. so now what, what happened? The place is flood, flooded with, got yeah. flooded with mini buses. Mm. Well, our problems got solved, remember? Mm -hmm. So that's how the government operates and should operate. They, give in, they should give good incentives for agriculture. The other goodness is the, the roads that are being built. The roads in the c countryside and so on, you'll see the program the gov that the government has is just excellent. And imagine if all these roads, which are so strong, they're not like the old roads that used to develop potholes within <laughs> <laughs> one rainfall. You know, They have drainages yeah, in the side. Yeah, and yeah. So then it l encourage people like, Patrick, where do you come from? Lopula. Lopula. And where do you come from? <laughs> Same place. Same place. <laughs> fish. There's a lot of fish yeah, in Lopula. Yeah, a lot of fish. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you were in eastern province or western province or in these areas, you could start a uh, program farms, you know, cashew nuts in western province. Mm -hmm. so northwestern, you could have your pineapples starting again. Eastern province, you have your maize and your ground nuts and everything. So people are, will develop all these huge areas of land which are still undeveloped in Zambia. So... So things are looking bright. Mm -hmm. This is a startup hour. As we uh, wind up, we're discussing uh, exploiting economic opportunities with the chairman of uh, the Devalia group of companies, Mr. Rafi Devalia. I want to zero in on this uh, before uh, Mwape comes in with his uh, final question and thoughts uh, on uh, mm -hmm. still in agriculture on maize. Have we made a mistake over the past, I don't know, 30, 40 years in in relying solely on maize production as we speak of uh, uh, agricultural diversification. And then number two, uh, there's been talk in certain circles that perhaps we, you, you coming from a textile background, that we have killed uh, the textile industry and the manufacturing uh, industry as a whole. Do you agree with that premise? Um, well, it's not for me to agree or not. It has happened, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is, uh, not only textiles, but other things. You see, when the, the MMD government came into power in 1991, mm -hmm. they, they looked at redu reduction of subsidies. There were no sacred cows. There were no, uh, no subsidies that were supposed to be given to anybody. And uh, if uh, industry is not doing well, let it die, that sort of thing. So uh, partly... It, it had a, partly it was right and partly it was wrong because any industry that you have has to be nurtured, nurtured, nurtured and then the subs subsidies have to be reduced um, as, as the growth yeah, slowly. Change, yeah. Yeah, in, in, a, in a reasonable manner so then the sub subsidies become zero, then you don't need the subsidy like if you have local banks then you have to support the local banks to a certain extent mm. and then subsidize them and then reduce the subsidies. This is what happened in uh, America in uh -huh. 2008 yeah. when the banks... Yeah. Uh, were the, the government bailed out. The government bailed them out. Uh -huh. And the same people were saying it when, when the banks like Prudence Bank and CAB and you, you, you can't bail out the banks, but you can't follow blindly what, what the West is saying. You've got to have your own plan. So when they were bailed out, what happened in America, in USA? They started making profits. They paid back the, the, the money, money, more yeah. money and more, and they survived. So th this is the thing. So you have to be very reasonable. In, in, in I think uh, the, the MMD government went a bit too quickly and too far in closing all these things. But look, um, I was in clothing. You asked me that question, clothing. Mm -hmm. You see, then the Chinese imports started coming in. When the Chinese imports started coming in, they were much cheaper than, than mm -hmm. the Zambian products. Then, of course, there was Salaula. When the Salaula came in, it was so cheap, and then the, some, many, most of the stuff was better than what was made in Zambia. Now, you, the government had to weigh the, the situation. Should they ban Salaula and Chinese products just to, to keep the, the Zambian industries running? Or let the consumers benefit by way of cheaper products coming in from outside? So they took the second uh, option of uh, supporting the consumers, which is also fair enough. Look, the government is in the business of of looking after the people it's not only there for business people like me and <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah because i've been on both sides of the fence mm. i've been in in, in in government as well as uh, on this so the government had to balance it out it's like second-hand cars coming in from japan how many of you can afford new cars if you want to buy a new car from toyota it'll <coughs> cost you a huge amount of money <coughs> but a second-hand toyota will cost you Maybe eight thousand or six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. A new one would cost you fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. 
So you can't say, oh, let's ban cars coming in from Japan mm -hmm. just to keep the local industry going. The, the lobby from the local industry will push and the lobby from the importing industry will push as well. So then the, this is what happened during uh, MMT's time. Mm -hmm. The lobby system came into, uh, into effect. Democracy was uh, there. And it's no, it was no more uh, 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 a centralized economy. It was a market economy. So uh, we are going in the right direction. Uh, no complaints no, as far as, oh, I, what I did is I, it's an opportunity to do another business. Mm -hmm. Okay, my textile business, there were about 100 factories in Livingston that closed. So I came to Lusaka. And when I came to Lusaka, I took up other challenges. I started a bureau de change in, in, the so in society. I started a top shop, whatever it is. I made a lot of money when the ma in Bureau de Change. Then I started the bank. Okay, the bank had a few problems. Fine. If one door is closed, thousands, hundreds of doors open. Then I started advertising. In the end, if you notice, uh, the, the, the thread running through my all my enterprises has been advertising. Starting from Cleopatra, I started advertising on front page. So in the end, and now I've come back to the original business that was meant for me, probably, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> which is advertising. Yeah. You see all billboards all over the place, magic, uh -huh. magic. We have over 100 billboards in, in, in Lusaka and uh, yeah. th throughout Zambia. And we do, as I said, that we are a one-stop shop. So uh, th this is what has happened, uh, Patrick. Um, all right, uh, I think uh, we're running out of time. So uh, I want to... I don't know, get, get your opinion. What more can our parents and government do to support the advancement of youth careers? You see, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very blanket question that you've asked me. Uh, yeah. um, you see, in, in you'll discover that entrepreneurs normally help themselves. The government can do a certain amount to help the entrepreneurs by way of creating programs, financing, you know, make it easier for for young people or entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to, uh, to 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 borrow start. money to start, and um, interest rate with reasonable interest rates, um, reasonable coverage of collateral means you don't have to have uh, that much collateral and mm -hmm. support you in a way. But of course, th what they'll do is th what they would know normally. Um, Look at your project proposal, yeah, and then and vet it, because otherwise the government will just lose money. They can't just be throwing good money after bad, you know. Yeah. So normally, even if five percent of the people or ten percent of the people succeed, that's good enough, because make no mistake about it, entrepreneurship is a risky business. And it's, it's not for everyone. And it's not for everyone. What I believe is that what the government should do is that create more large businesses. I said it in at, at Yali. I don't know whether you were the Young African, young leaders, African leaders Initiative. I said we need 20 more Dangotes in Zambia because the people like Dangotes, they create employment for the middle management. The middle class should be developed in Zambia. We don't have a good middle class. You can't have everybody doing business. Who's going to buy your product if everybody is an entrepreneur? <laughs> hmm? You go to... To Lumumba Road, you go to, everybody is a business person, huh? selling this and selling that. There are more business people than, than customers. Huh? Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's not the solution. The solution is to develop big I business in Zambia. Let them come in and they'll provide the, the business, uh, I mean the, the, the middle class, class, the middle class the, to be developed in Zambia. Then there are those entrepreneurs... It's only 10% of the population can become entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can start, uh, or 20%, you know. So those people who are really keen to do business, they will do business. And you know what? They actually don't need much help. They fight their own battles, you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the ha what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. They know it. You know, you, you fail, you succeed. You, you fall, you stand up. You fall, you stand up. And then you succeed. So government will try all the best, I'm sure. Uh, through the, the citizenship empowerment, uh, whatever it is, and youth programs. But the idea is to create more investments in Zambia. You mentioned tourism, you mentioned agriculture, you mm. mentioned everything, construction industry, road building. The once a, 
infrastructure development. You know, like there's so much congestion in Lusaka. What we need is a new system, a ring road system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to channel the traffic that we have. Otherwise, in, by next year, two years' time, you won't be able to move on this mm -hmm. uh, on, on Cairo Road and <coughs> at Lumumba Road. So all these things have to be done. And uh, so, and the, so don't get worried. <laughs> and for the parents. <coughs> Parents of uh, uh, the parents of many entrepreneurs out there. They, some of them don't really understand when the child tells them, "Listen, mom, I'm going into business to do this." But why? Just get a job. And in actual sense, that's not what someone wants to do. Someone wants to go out and create jobs. So I think Patrick, I mean uh, Mwape, I think you want to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's part of the ten percent. <laughs> he's part of the ten percent. Yes. Why not? Why not? Why not? You see, this is what happened. I worked for. A dress factory, and I started my own dress factory. You worked for Power FM. You'll start your own, <laughs> your your studio, isn't it? Mm. So that's how it goes because you've developed um, knowledge and and marketing from, from sitting here. Well, the parents, you know, it's like a parent. Uh, you know, the son says, "Dad, I want to become a football player." You know, so the father will say, "What? Well, how? What are you going to earn in football?" You know, but that guy may turn up into a great footballer. Or he might uh, start a big sporting business mm -hmm. uh, in football. Because if you follow your passion, um, if your business becomes, uh, you know, if you follow your passion, then your passion becomes your business. And then in that case, it's no more work. Yeah, it's, it's just... It's a, you are doing something that you love. So it's no more, oh God, I have to go and to my, open my office now. Ah. No, you say, oh, let me go and open my office. It's mm. fun, you know. Yeah. You, you don't have to push yourself. So... The parents realize that. And most of the parents, they know the children. They know the abilities of each child. And they'll encourage them. And if you can produce the results. The first thing my father said is, are you sure you want to do business? <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Do you know how many factories there are in Zambia? Do you know how many? You have to be, you know, they always say, be careful, mm -hmm. which is good for you. But then, you see, power is never given. The power is taken. This is what Chairman Mao said, you know. Power is taken, it's never never given. So the, the kids or the young people who have to do business, they have to do it. Even if the parents say no, mm -hmm. you have to prove to your parents that you're capable of doing business. I have to take back the power at this time. Yeah. Mr. Ravi <laughs> Diwali, we could go on and on. It's been great having you in the studio. He's taken back the power. I have to get back the power now. Power FM. Yes, indeed. It's been a great honor and pleasure having you in the studio, sir. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you, Pleasure. indeed. We've been speaking with Mr. Ravi Devalia, who's uh, the chairman of uh, the Devalia Group of Companies, and we've been discussing exploiting economic opportunities. Thank you for tuning in to the Startup Hour. Ravi, it's been a pleasure. Informative and insightful session all rolled up in one. Catch us again next week, same time, same day, as we bring you more influential business and thought leaders. Be inspired. And remember, the only person responsible for Zambia's development is you. you. So what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. This has been Start Up Hour, bringing successful Zambian entrepreneurs, policymakers, and subject experts to share their stories. Start Up Hour, in association with Power FM.